puts this sick drum roll right on the front of it dude just like yeah yeah i'm right so high i can hear heaven i was just like my mind was blown dude and my mind is played- blown that i'm here with you getting to hear you sing this amazing song from all these years ago like all these years later man um, it's an honor dude man it's an honor for me to get to tell you this story <laughs> Battle Line Podcast, you guys see what it is. Josie Scott from Saliva, really formerly of Saliva, but you know him for all the hits. Click, click, boom, always, your disease. Also, of course, and we get into it, the song that you guys all know from the uh, Spider-Man soundtrack with Chad Kroger, Hero. Everybody knows that song. This was a great interview. I think you guys are going to dig it. We have a new video person on board. Shout out to Harold, who is going to be doing an awesome job with everything. Um, before we get into everything, I got to tell you guys, Ned has been such a lifesaver for me. I'm not just saying this as just a generic read for them. I tend to have the upper, upper back and my neck is a problem area for me, for sure. Every few months, I'm just like hunched over and having issues. And th- look, there's no magic bullet. As a personal trainer, I will say like doing my own rehabilitation of doing like lat pull downs and um and also doing like rowing that that tends to help doing light weight for that but you know what has really helped is cbd from ned and it's just like when i take cbd from ned i know that i'm getting a quality product made here in america it's not just some crap on the shelves that everywhere else made in china this is quality cbd it is premium and uh they don't just do cbd but that's a favorite of mine and i should also throw out there the relief bomb that's been a lifesaver as well so ned has just helped me tremendously during this minor injury i'm like back in action after only a few days it sounds miraculous but it's the truth um but there are other supplements they do magnesium supplements their mellow supplement and their super blend uh, latte with over 700 five star customer reviews. Ned's Mellow Magnesium is an instant hit. Nourish your entire body with Ned's proprietary super blend with three forms of chelated magnesium, GABA, L theanine, and over 70 trace minerals. It propels memory, mood, brain function, stress response, nerve and muscle health, and sleep. And about 75% of Americans are deficient in it. Ned's Mellow Magnesium is now available on Amazon, but you'll get the best deal through us as a first-time customer when you go to helloned.com slash battleline. And the great thing about their website too, if there's certain things that you're looking to heal, whether it's that you're having sleep issues or whether it's like me and you have an injury that you're looking to remedy, um, it gives you a full rundown of what you want on the website. Or if you're looking for something that's going to boost your brain function, your cognitive function, they have the brain blend on there, which is what I've been taking a lot recently with the um, with the neck issue because it's the CBD mixed with the neuro, uh, nootropic and just a great, all great products there. Check it out, guys. So many of our audience already has and are now subscribers and are getting products regularly from them. So helloned.com slash battleline or add the code battleline at checkout. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D dot com slash battleline. All right, enough of me talking here. Let's get right over to Josie Scott of Saliva. From Kansas City to New York City, from planet Earth to extraterrestrial life in space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Switch is on. Mother, I'm gonna shoot you in the face. Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dating for a long time. You are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast.
the switch is on battle line podcast and really excited to have a very special guest on josie scott former lead singer and songwriter for saliva also solo artist and truly as a fan and uh, everything else it's an honor and and actually what came to my attention to contact you was i heard the interview with jamie josta and beyond just like i said being a fan of your work i could tell you're just a very personable down to earth guy. I loved the interview with uh, with Jamie and figured we'd be able to make this happen, hopefully. And here we are. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Ian. I really am so glad to be here and I'm excited and actually a little nervous. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you've, you've probably <laughs> done how many interviews in your span, in your, your, the span of your career? I've done a lot, but I don't know. For some reason, I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, a little nervous today. You got me. You got me shook. That's funny, <laughs> As man. The kids are, say, "Are are you uh, currently doing shows?" Because I I saw actually when I booked you and I was speaking to your publicist, you had some like shows going on, and I do know that you announced like a more recent band. Is that what you're doing? Are you doing your current band project or your solo project or what? It's kind of confusing, um, and I'm glad you're giving me a chance to explain this. Of I course. am doing shows. I am doing shows right now. Um, I'm just doing them under the Josie Scott's saliva type deal right now because cool. I, I just wanted to get back out there. You know what I mean? Um, and I planned, I plan on in the future doing a shade violent record, which is my pet project. Um, uh, my little solo project is all, as all musicians say my side project. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about uh, doing that um, with my uh, stepson, Dynamite Delone and, and my new band. But right now, just to get back out there and, and get my sea legs back, I'm just going out as Josie Scott's saliva and uh, doing a set of all the saliva hits and um, just, you know, really excited to get back on the road and you know the road does something to your your voice and uh to your body that nothing else does i've tried to achieve it in the gym i've tried to achieve it with some sporadic shows here or there but there's nothing like getting smoke on your clothes as they say in <laughs> nashville you know what i mean i like i like getting out there and, and playing i'm a road dog man i'm i'm an yeah. old road dog so is that the time when you say Josie Scott's saliva, is this going to be the same type of thing we've seen with, it's crazy with so many bands, how there's like two Queensryche touring, there were two LA Guns touring, or is, you know, what what is left of the former band, which we can get into, are they going to be touring as their own saliva and you're going to be touring as your version of saliva? Like, are there issues with who owns the rights to the name and all that type of stuff? No, no, no. We, we've... Got, I've gotten along really well with uh, with Bobby, the current singer sure. of of the the new version of Saliva, and uh, we're very dear friends. And we haven't really uh, had any issue over the name. I think you know that he, you know, I have to I have to tiptoe through this a little bit, but yeah. I think he I think he understands. You know that we kind of share uh the name a little bit i'm just going out to play my hits i'm not i'm not going out to to play in any other saliva music so i i don't think i'm uh stepping on any toes really i'm just you know kind of going out there to like i said get my sea legs back and it, the, the other thing i meant to interject into this end is uh uh, and I apologize for my long answers. No, no, uh, people, people want to hear this. And and I think, you know, like I said, the interview with Jamie, at least for me, it was the first interview I heard with you in a long time. So I think people are excited to hear you expand on all this. So yeah, go for it. Well, thanks, man. Um, you know, nobody expected our dear Wayne Sweeney to pass away. It was so fast and so sudden. Um, I was literally working out in the gym one day. I had just talked to him a, a few days before that about coming in and doing some solos on my shade violent stuff. And, and, you know, um, just had a, a wonderful uh, final conversation with him. You know, you never know when you're going to 
speak to somebody uh, the last time. Um, and I was literally working out in the gym. I saw something flash across my notifications and it said, uh, Wayne Sweeney's in the hospital. He's on a ventilator. And I was like, first thing I thought was COVID, man. No, not again. You know what I mean? And, and, and also, I mean, I, and I do know, you know, and people could look this up, of course, and not to rehash, but I mean, your own son dying of COVID. So, yeah, that, that, that's, that's what I thought was, uh, in, in May of, uh, 21 on May 22nd, my, my own son, my, my oldest boy, Cody, uh, passed away from COVID in 12 days, you know? So I know how fast and hard COVID can hit. So I figured Wayne got sick on the road. He went to get checked out. He probably lost oxygen and they, they've already put him on a ventilator was what my mind was thinking. So I ran outside and, uh, some, I think my wife sent me a message and she said, you need to call Bobby now. And so, like I said, me and Bobby are very close. And I, I immediately called him and I said, what's going on? And he explained what had happened. Uh, he explained that they had to uh, call uh, for uh, medical help for Wayne. Uh, when the help got there, they uh, took him to the local hospital where they um, deduced that he was going to need more help than they could give him. They airlifted him then to Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, they discovered, you know, that he had had a, some, some type of brain aneurysm. And they were trying to do um, this type of maneuver uh, where they, I think they do some kind of sh shunt or something they call it in the medical field where they, they're trying to relieve the pressure from the brain. And they, they tried that and Wayne's uh, blood pressure was just like crazy, like 200 over 300 or something crazy like that. And uh, they could not get the pressure to come down. And um, that's when Bobby called me and, and it was just, you know, it was, uh, uh, we, we had to have a really horrible conversation about, you know, it, it, you know, Bobby just, I'll never forget Bobby saying, Josie, I'm so sorry. It, it doesn't look like it's going to go our way. And, um, you know, just, and this was all within, within two hours of hearing about this and, uh, yeah, the amount of, you've no time to process it. No, yeah, absolutely no time to process it. Um, I'm calling other band members, you know, uh, I called Nate, Dave Novotny, uh, I called Todd Poole, the original drummer, I called Paul Crosby, the, the second uh, drummer, and, you know, was just trying to, to, like you said, process this. And by the time uh, I got all those calls around, um, they uh, they called back and said they were going to do a test to see if he had any brain activity. And they came back and said that he did not. And they retested and retested and retested just to make absolutely sure, you know, that, uh, that there was no brain activity. And, and unfortunately his brain activity did not return. They, uh, made the decision uh i i believe then some decisions were made within his family uh it gets really personal after that and and yeah. you know wayne uh unfortunately lost his life and we were just absolutely devastated because like you said we're, we're all you know we're still sending message saying messages saying pray for wayne sweeney this is not good you know please everybody get together and pray. And it was already over with. It was just like that, man. It was um, just, you know, just one of the saddest uh, situations that I've ever been through besides my son uh, in my life, you know, watching one of my best friends slip away and then going back and thinking how amazingly talented this man was. I mean, he was the, he was like our godfather, man. You know what I mean? He was a couple of years older than us and he was 
he was like our Mick Mars, you know what I mean? He <laughs> was, he was that guy, you know, he was the best guitar player in Memphis. He was like Randy Rhodes. Like he was already a legend before he was ever in saliva because he was in this huge band called TNA back in the eighties. And then, you know, I was lucky enough to get him, uh, when I put saliva together and just could not be more grateful and thankful to have gotten to spend the amount of time with him that I did. I, you know, um, just go back and appreciate every single show, every single interview, every single bus ride, those long bus rides at night when you set up talking about everything from God to girls, to money, to life, to, children and all those great conversations I, I wouldn't take nothing for them and um after that happened man it was just it was time for all of us but but certainly for me to like re-rack everything I was like okay so I've got to put the shade violent thing on hold and I'm just gonna go out and honor this music for a while. I'm just going to go sure. out and pour myself into honoring Wayne Sweeney's memory and honoring this saliva music that I was involved with. That's awesome. I mean, I think people are probably going to want to see it on the road as it gets to their town. And the thing is, listening to that interview you did with Jamie Josta, which Jamie acknowledged was probably like a few weeks before this happened, you could tell that regardless of the fact that you guys were no longer working together for years, I mean, you stepped away from the band many years ago, like you spoke so highly of him and every band kind of has those core members who write the songs, write the lyrics and, and, you know, Steven Tyler. And, and you think of, uh, wait, why, am, why am I not forgetting Joe Perry? I was about to forget Joe Perry's name. Jeez. But you could tell that you two were those core members. And if you look at who wrote the, the vast majority of the songs, it was you two both of you guys. And yeah, I mean, it's what's really a shame too is there was always so much talk as a fan of Saliva and a fan of this music that you were at some point going to step back in. And I know that they did that 20 year anniversary of the first studio album and people were hoping to see you come back. And I don't know if it was because of your son's situation and all that, but being that you guys were still on speaking terms, I think people were thinking, okay, this, this may happen. We may see this classic lineup reunite and i guess it just wasn't meant to be or something well uh, another thing that happened was i called my best friend scott willis in little rock and i just i just said the same thing i said to bobby i said oh my god what do we do now what do we do now you know because i was just lost uh, like you said Ian. i did not have time to process it i was just grabbing at straws um, I was at the gym with my 16 year or 17 year old son, Justice, at the time. And I'm trying to figure out how to deliver this news to my, ch to my ch child, you know, and deliver uh, uh, this to my best friend who, who are gonna, gonna, I'm gonna break their hearts. I'm gonna absolutely break two of my favorite people in the whole world's hearts. And it's hard to do that. And obviously you have to, because it's reality. Um, but the first thing that my best friend Scott said, and I'll never forget it, is he said, thank God for Blue Ridge. And uh, Blue Ridge was a concert that uh, we all had the fortunate of meeting up uh, on the road and uh, playing like the four hit songs. I think we did Always Your Disease and Click, Click, Boom. Uh, we got to do that in front of like- When, I think when was, like was that? Because people. I didn't even hear about that. When was that? I think it was in, I think it was in September. Oh, wow. So it was just this past year. I, I wasn't even aware of that, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 had that last moment, you know, and um, people took a lot of pictures and uh, my wife took a lot of pictures and- uh, Bobby's bass player um, uh, took a lot of pictures that day and uh, I was just so thankful for that moment you know because I got to to sing those songs one last time with my with my musical soulmate you know with with one of my best friends That's um, so cool. 
and we got to hug each other and and in front of 60,000 people and it was just it was a a great rock and roll moment in time I'm so thankful and grateful that that happened yeah that's that's incredible it's a great story and and it's also I it's it's great to hear as a fan of your music that you do get along with their current singer or the guy who's touring in saliva Bobby because I will say I check out the newer stuff that they've done. And I, I even heard the remakes that they did of your original material. And I could say, I mean, no one's ever going to replace you, but he's a hell of a singer. I, and it's good to hear that you're not one of these guys who's better, who's like, you know, oh, he's just singing my crap. Because I think he puts his own spin on it. I don't think he's trying to imitate you. He's got his own unique way of singing those songs, but they'll always be your songs. Absolutely. And, and, and like I said, I'm dear friends with Bobby. Uh, I'm dear friends with his dad. His his father was there for me uh, when my son died and I didn't even know him. And, you know, it's funny who, you know, God puts in your pathway. You know what I mean? When, th- when things happen, it's the most unexpected people that you don't really think are going to be the people that are there for you at that moment. Um but Bobby's dad was one of those people, man. And he was, he was just there for me and he would call me, he would make sure I was okay. He would, uh, you know, check on me. I mean, every few days uh, he would, he would call and, and check on me, send me messages and send me uh, pictures, anything to keep me uh, involved in a back and forth conversation, because I think he knew as a father, if I, you know, just sat, alone and and let this take me let it's sort of like letting the ocean take you man i i was at the point where the ocean was about to take me down you know what i mean and um just you know i i remember when cody first died i was googling everything and uh i googled losing a child and how do you cope with losing a child and I, I Googled it and it said the ultimate tragedy. Mm, I'll never I mean, forget it is, that. Yeah. And, um, you know, trying to, to deal with that and, and make my way through that and process that was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. And uh, Bobby's dad was absolutely filled with love and kindness and was was there for me uh in that situation and was there for all of us uh for this wayne situation as well you know and i i just couldn't be more thankful for for bobby's dad and for bobby bobby put together one of the most thoughtful life celebrations for this man that ever could have been put together i mean he made t-shirts he made necklaces he made grab bags for all the guests that came in uh, he made everybody feel like they could take a part of how special Wayne was and how amazingly talented he was. He gave all of them a piece of that to take home with them. And I think that was just unbelievably thoughtful and kind and considerate. And I, I don't have any, uh, any kind of uh, animosity or, or, or anything Uh, towards Bobby I think when you know when something first happens and you leave a band and you see you hear that there's another guy uh up there uh doing their thing it's like watching your your ex-old lady you know be out with a guy for the first time and you're it it hurts you know and especially singing singing these songs that have deep personal meaning to you like they're these are your babies yeah but he has been nothing but a gentleman throughout the the whole thing man and he uh has has carried himself uh in such an honorable way you know that um i couldn't be more thankful for bobby and and all that he's done and and I'm, i'm super proud of him and you know i i look forward to to working with him in the future we're gonna do a a song together uh called horizon that is a uh wayne swan song actually it was the last song that wayne played on and so i'm really you know excited to to do that and that's just the kind of man that bobby is he's 
uh, created these opportunities and, and created these moments that we can all have and take with us that couldn't be more special and, and more heartwarming and, and heartfelt and really, you know, well thought out. Is there a possibility you guys will join forces and hit the road together? Because, you know, one of the biggest interviews I had was Edsel Dope and he was fundamental in, in bringing Static X back out, out on the road. And I think anybody would say Static X without Wayne Static, but they're playing bigger venues than they even did when Wayne Static was alive. I mean, I think people would love to see a celebration of this music with you back on vocals, with some of the core members. I mean, do you see that happening? Absolutely. You know, I, I've, I've learned to never say never, you know, um, but, anything anything's possible you know i know he's down uh for for something like that i know i'm down for something like that you know um and and blue ridge was was a great example of what we could pull together you know um so yeah i'm i'm totally i'm totally down with with whatever he would like to do um and i'm excited about you know going out on the road and and doing of uh, my you know tribute sure. to to my songs and and uh they're just fun songs to play man you know oh, like yeah. ladies and gentlemen and always and your disease and uh click click people, boom I, I think people forget how many hits you guys had i think yeah. people really do i think sometimes those are songs people will hear on the radio and oh this was saliva too i think some people might just think of click click boom or they might just think of hero with chad kroger but like there's a lot of tracks there. Yeah, I think we're the, we're like the survivor or the foreigner of the early 2000s. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I mean, hey, I, man. I was in high school at that time. I grew up with those songs. Yeah, what what a what what a blessed and magnificent place to be that we can say something like that because I, you know, I spent my entire 90 uh, my entire 20s and all of the 90s out on that road you know playing to just bar employees uh night after night after night and i thought you know is this ever gonna amount to anything is this ever gonna are we ever gonna break out and is something ever gonna happen and it did happen and something inside my gut knew not to stop it knew not to give up i mean i was having my own family members uh, uh were telling me you know you ought to think about going back to college or you know you should you should probably think of having something to fall back on and i was like hell no i ain't giving up you know what i mean yeah. and, and i'm so glad that i didn't but you know as my dad used to say luck is where preparation meets opportunity and we just kept preparing and preparing and preparing. And that opportunity finally came, you know, with Lior Cohen and, and with Island Def Jam. And, you know, they had a chip on their shoulder to prove their rock balls, you know what I mean? And we were just in the right place at the right time. And they teed us up perfectly. And, uh, and we have the right, you know, at the end of the day, I tell younger musicians at the end of the day, this, this game is about songs. This sure. game is, is not about your band name. Your band name's great and your band members are great, but all that doesn't mean shit from Shinola if you don't have songs, you know what I mean? You got to have those songs and, um, I'm just so thankful that we have that that group of songs, like you said, because I'll, I'll run into people and one person will be like, oh, my God, saliva, you know, I love I love you guys. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then their friend will be like, well, who, now who is saliva? And you'll be like, you know, that they had that song always, always. I just can't live with that. And they'll be like, oh, yeah. And then they go, well, we, they had that other song called click click boom they're like oh my god that's them and so, it's gonna be surreal know. for you and at the same time you're probably like yeah i've gone through this a million times before <laughs> but you know what i never get tired of it it never gets old the you know the the first thing that people say to me that shocks me 
is don't you get tired of this man or, or I, I know you're probably sick of it but can i get you to sign this or man i'm just like do you know how many shitty bars i played to nobody to for this to happen i'm so grateful and thankful that that i that i God picks me out of all these people to get to, to be this guy. I get to be this guy. You know what I mean? And a, and a lot of bands lose that perspective. They do. They they lose that perspective because they're out on the road, all the amount of temptation out there, the whole drug, sex, rock and roll thing, which we can get into. And they forget where they came from because there are those right. bands out there who no longer want to take pictures with fans and no longer want to sign things. Or there's even people I invite to come on the podcast. Like you were enthusiastic about coming on. There's some people who, you know, unless you're at the level of Joe Rogan, they're like, take a hike. I got other things to do. So. Right. And, and I've, I've never understood that, you know, I know that this, this kind of life can be tedious and, and, you know, you, you definitely uh, can, can, uh, can experience some burnout and everybody has a bad day. You know, doctors have a bad day. Plumbers have a bad day. You know, uh, mental health professionals have a bad day. I, I learned something in the mental health field called, uh, compassion. Uh, uh, it was, it was called, uh, compassion anxiety or, or, uh, they, they get their, their compassion. They use their compassion so much that, that they're, they're, that they, they lose the sensitivity of their compassion and they have to step yeah. away and take a break from their field because it just get it just melts their brain in a way. Uh, I know I'm saying that wrong by the way, but. Yeah, uh, but, but people are getting the, I think people are getting the gist of what you're saying. Yeah. That, that their yeah. whole compassion job has fatigue. to be. Got it. Okay. It just came to me. Compassion fatigue. Uh, and, and I was like, well, what's compassion fatigue? And they were like, well, you know, you deal with so many people every day and you're trying to help them and you're trying to get them to the next, you know, cog, you know, in the in the in the lineup. And, and sometimes you you fail and sometimes you succeed and you just, it, it, it will spiritually and mentally and physically drain you. And once I worked in the mental health field, I've, I've finally figured out what they were talking about. But still, at the end of the day, I just I, I'm just so grateful and thankful to have have been chosen to be this guy. Jim Jim Carrey had a great quote about it. He said, I have done something in this life that makes other people present their best self to me <laughs> and yeah. i just thought that's so cool man you know because that's true when you go when you go up to these people and they are fans they're like oh man oh my gosh it's so good to meet you you know and they want to know about your life and they want to know about your music and they want to tell you how your music has been medicine to them and how that your music has helped them with anxiety or helped them with depression or helped them through a bad relationship or helped them through uh, being a kid and navigating through the teenage years and listening to their mom and dad fight outside the door while they were listening to your songs. And I'm just so grateful to get to be that person because I was that kid behind the door yeah. listening to his mom and dad fight. And, and, you know, I was that kid in abusive relationships. And I, I'm just so thankful to see people using my music as medicine. There could not be a bigger compliment in the world than for someone to say, your music helped me through a really hard time in my life. That's the biggest compliment ever. And it always puts a smile on my face, man, because I know I'm making a difference. Yeah. And with, that's what it's with, all about, having a positive impact on people. But, you yeah. know, what, this, this is a good transition, I think, to talk about when you're saying compassion fatigue and people being like, I can't do this anymore. I don't think I've ever heard you really expand on this. Uh, and I do know that at the time you said, I want to focus on a Christian solo career. Uh, so why did you step away from the band? Because it's been many, many years since you were the front man for Saliva. 
And I think, you know, people thought you were going to go on to your own solo career. You certainly could have had a huge solo career. When you think of a song like Hero with Chad Kroger, you are not someone who needs to be pigeonholed into this like hard rock or new metal stereotype of what Saliva has put in, even though I think that band is so much more versatile. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'd love to hear like, what was the reason that you stepped away and were out for so long? Um, I mean, I, I remember seeing that video that went up on, on the internet of you singing in a church and people are like, well, wow, this is just so strange to see. This is not what we think of when we think of Josie Scott from Saliva. So <laughs> right. I'd love to hear the full story because it's so many years that you've been away. Well, you know, I think I got to a point where for me personally, I just got to a point where I had to weigh, um, I had to count the cost of what uh, I was doing in my life. And I was in a really scary, unhealthy place. Um, I had just, I think we had all, if I'm completely honest, I think we had all just been at the party for too long. Um, I had went down a really dark road and um, I was going to this witch doctor type <laughs> therapist that had me on all kinds of high powered, uh, antidepressants. And I'm not speaking bad of, of antidepressants. They can certainly help someone. I'm not, uh, trying to Tom Cruise you at all, but, um, I was just on the, uh, a, a, a lot of the wrong medicines that weren't right for me. Um, things that that you know schizophrenic medications and just crazy wild prescriptions that I had no business being on and I was I was just trying to fly the plane man I was trying to to land the plane in a safe field or whatever and the stick was broken man I, I couldn't navigate my life anymore and I had just uh I just had a little girl and uh, my daughter um, Jordan was born in 2011 and we had had some complications with, with her. Uh, we almost lost her. You know, she was uh, born with uh, this really bad, uh, she had inhaled some amniotic fluid and had, had some really bad pneumonia and we almost lost her and just a lot of, things were intersecting in my life that were red flags or like you know you need to you got to start taking care of some of this stuff or you're, or you're not going to make it you know what yeah. I mean and I I just it was a hard decision you know it was one of the hardest decisions I ever made in my life but you know I I talked about it with um you know my my wife and I talked about it with uh a spiritual advisor of mine at the time. And, uh, I just realized that I had to, I had to step away and get myself healthy. Uh, because like they say on the airplane, they say, put on yeah. your oxygen mask before you put on everybody else's. And I was struggling to put on everybody else's oxygen mask. And I, I wasn't taking care of myself and I, I and I was about to black out and, uh, I had to, I had to make the decision to step away and, and get healthy. And I, I, uh, I had to, you know, pour all those medications, uh, down the toilet and just, um, go through that valley, you know, like did, they did say, you, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask, like, no. did you have a change of perspective? Because when people do think of saliva, they do think of like the whole sex, drugs, rock and roll lifestyle that is embedded <laughs> in the music. And then to do a 180 of that and say, I'm going to focus on having a Christian solo music career. Was it just like, man, this music that I wrote 10, 15 years ago, like this is no longer who I am. This is no longer the image I want to put out there. Was it that type of thing? Like, cause we, we saw that with like head from corn and, and other guys who have been like, yeah, this is not the image I want to put out there anymore. Was there some of that? I, I believe that had some, I believe that had something to do with it, but, um, I, I think I 
because when when I first left the band, they immediately put that press release out about me becoming a, a Christian solo artist, and that was not the reason I left. I mean, I think time uh, has shown everybody that 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 was absolutely not the reason I left. That was just a good answer to to give to the press at that time, and I never really understood why the people that were managing us at the time felt the need to 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 put that out there um you know i am a christian uh and i had uh explored uh with a couple of uh record company guys there in nashville about maybe doing uh a christian solo album or something like that but i basically was told that there were a lot of snakes on that side of the fence as well and and uh, oh, yeah. basically basically got which there there are anywhere you know yeah no I mean, I, mean I, I I mentioned head from corn I've read head from corn's books and and he had that same experience where he's like these guys who I thought were you know my brothers in Christ were ripping me off of my money and yeah I think that you do see snakes right. in, in all aspects of life and and people you know want to suck in these people who have some type of fame or some type of notoriety and leech off of them in, in any aspect whether it's this music world or christian music world or elsewhere so i understand that and and you know uh after stepping away and and getting healthier and uh sort of getting back on my feet i i got to spend some time at home with my wife and with my children and I was just like I just want to be a regular guy for a while man I I just want to be a father sure, and I want to sure. be a husband and I want to watch my little girl uh grow up um my my son was uh you know very young at the time justice was very young at the time um and, you know, he was getting physically sick before I would go on the road and it was just breaking my heart, you know, and I, I never wanted to bring children into this world just to upset them and break their yeah. hearts and, and make them sick with the life with the life that I was living. So it, it was more about me getting a taste of just being a dad and just being a husband. Sure. And I was like, wait a minute, this is really, really cool, man. And uh, so I, you know, once the blinders were off and I got off all that fog, I got, I came out of that fog, you know what I mean? That all those medications had me in. I was like, well, this is pretty cool. I think I could enjoy this. And uh, I just relished in the fact that I was uh, blessed to get to be this woman's husband and blessed to get to be the father of these kids. And I just wanted to focus on being a dad. And the music never stopped. I have a phone right now that's full of songs. And it started around 2011 and 12 of just song after song, ideas that would come to me and I would uh, write them down because I've never been one of those guys that sat down and, and said, okay, we're gonna write a song and you know and just choose i can't just sit down and do it yeah. like that it, it doesn't have to be planned it, it's something that just comes through me elvis said one time he said it's not from me it's through me i just have the best seat in the house <laughs> that's great and you know th that, this audience i swear to you man they're gonna love hearing this story because there is such a similarity between your story and chris peranto who's usually here but the big difference between you guys is for you it was like life on the road and for chris it was life deployed whether as an army ranger or cia contractor and he was doing it up until his late 40s and he was like, and he same thing as a young kid. And he's like, I want to be back home with my family. And Chris has talked about on the podcast, he had several times he wanted to take his life. And he was like, I need to fix myself. I need to get back to that person that I'm meant to be. And now it's like, he's with his wife, with his kids, where they live in Kansas. And he's not someone you see now on Fox News all the time or CNN. And he's like, because this is not really what I want to do anymore. He does his motivational speeches on the road does this podcast with me that's actually why he can't be here he's he's out on the road doing a motivational speech but yeah very similar lifestyle i think in terms of that although he's a guy who lived it out in combat you were out on the road touring 
But I think, yeah, being away and not having a place to call home and not being with your family and not being that father, it, it has to take a toll on you. I, I totally understand that. Yeah. I can't wait to meet Chris. It's such a pleasure to meet you, Ian. But I can't <laughs> wait to meet uh, Chris as well because we do. And he's, he's, dude, he's really disappointed he couldn't come out for real because he, he called me and he wanted to make this. And he's like, not only was I a fan, not only was I listening to that music overseas while as an army ranger as a contractor he's like man that guy could sing he was like but i i have to last minute be on the road to do this speech out in colorado so like we'll do it we'll do another one at some point but i, I do think that there's that, a similarity i was gonna say that gives me a good excuse to come back man <laughs> so i can so i can hang and meet meet chris as well as you uh again yeah, that would be but, that would be awesome I, mean, I have plenty of stuff i still want to get to so hopefully we, we can um here absolutely. but you know, that actually is a good segue to what I was going to ask you as well when I was saying how Chris was out deployed listening to Saliva and as well as listening to bands like Disturbed and Slipknot. He's like, this is what we listen to when we're out, when we have to kill the bad guy, when we have to go on raids, kick down doors. I mean, how many veterans have you heard from who said when I was out in Iraq or Afghanistan, we were listening to Click, Click, Boom? <laughs> so many I, that... I'm so grateful and thankful that we got to do so much with the armed forces. Um, we got to go over to uh, South Korea and Japan in 2007. And then the last tour I did with Saliva, we went back over on the USO tour and we did South Korea again and we did Japan again and we hit all the uh, American um, USO um, armed military forces. bases, yeah. yeah, military bases. We hit all the military bases and got to spend some good quality time with those guys and hear their stories and you know see the tears in their eyes and and you know get to hug them and and you know I had several of them give me uh, their their toe tags and it was just it was a crazy moving experience, man. But I had several of them show me videos on their phone of of them painting click click boom down the barrel of their tank or whatever and and uh playing for me the the music they were listening to uh at the time and they were like yeah we listen to click click boom right before we go in and fuck somebody up <laughs> it's such a natural song for that i feel like it's it's such a natural like i mean it's a song i hear at the gym all the time it's just it, it is that I know like in this world, like toxic masculinity, but it is that like alpha male aggression type theme that you hear. You know what I wanted to ask you about that song? Cause I've always thought about this in my head and I'm not sure if you have, um, but I looked this up myself just to make sure I was right on this. Shortly okay. after you put out click, click, boom. And I don't know if you know where I'm going with this. POD put out, here comes the boom. And I've always felt like, do you think that song was inspired by you guys or do you think it was just coincidence? Because for one, how many songs have the word boom in the title and they're a very similar aggression type of song? Like I'm, there, there's even been times at the gym, I swear to you, this has happened to me that either your song went on or click or, uh, or here comes the boom comes on and someone is like, oh, I love this song. And they're like, oh, I, I was thinking of the other song because they, if you're just the casual music listener, they almost sound like the same song. So is right. it just me that I felt like this may have been a ripoff of Click Click Boom, which came out first? They're both great songs, but you know, I don't know. Uh, we as a, as a as a hockey young man, I I think I explored that, uh, especially in the lyrics of uh, a song called Superstar Two that we did. Oh, but gosh, man, just I don't regret it, but. I kind of do regret it because it it was just uh, uh, sort of shots fired. Uh, oh, so you have you have said something about it? Yeah, I mean, but just being a young hockey singer, man, you know, <laughs> back in the day. But but later on in life, I got to meet Sonny, and I got to meet the guys in POD and and hang out with them, and just. They could not be, I think it was really a coincidence. I don't think, I don't think they were biting off of us uh, as much as it was just, it was just a, a really, really 
amazing coincidence. Um, those guys are so sweet and kind, and I, I've never met uh, a more loving, um, you know, fan-oriented band than POD and watching how they touch people live and, you know, um, watching Sonny go out there and just sing his heart out and, you know, watching him, you know, give glory uh, to his maker during his shows is, is just something that's breathtaking to watch. And I've seen Head, you know, do the same thing during a corn set. And you just never, you just never think you're going to be at a corn concert and watch a man, you know, just totally give it up to, you know, his, his uh, to, to his, to his maker like they do. And, it, it just, it, I know it touches me deep in my spirit um, to, to, watch, to watch them do that. Uh, another one that was a really close call that you, that, you're, uh, that you haven't asked me about, though, was uh, I heard somebody tell me one time in an interview, they said, uh, did you guys get the uh, idea for always from that? Uh, three days gray song that i hate everything about i know that's a, yeah why and i was like no i don't i don't think so i was like i don't hear the similarity studio. as much in that hey guys hope you're enjoying this interview with josie scott from saliva i think we covered a lot of incredible ground i mean I'm pretty sure this is the first interview. He told me it's the first interview he did since the death of Wayne Swinney. And as you as you did here, we get into all of that and much more. Um, really an honor to have him on, and I'm sure we'll have him back. Uh, before we continue, Fort Scott Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. They have these tins available on the website. I think they still have the Battleline Tactical tins. Check it out, guys. Best ammo on the market. This ammo was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military-grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring they receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, but you'll get the best deal through us, as always with all our sponsors, when you go to fsm.com and you use the promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast. fsm.com, promo code BATTLELINE. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and the BATTLELINE podcast. Once again, guys, fsm.com, promo code BATTLELINE. Best ammo on the planet. Let's get right back to Josie Scott. So you know what I wanted to make sure I ask you about when we're talking about like all the hits that you've been a part of? I think one of the obvious ones, and although it's not saliva, it's you, is Hero from the Spider-Man soundtrack with Chad Kroger. I mean, what what was it like being asked by Chad Kroger to be a part of that song? And it's a song that is so legendary. And I think of being back in high school when that came out. And it's also because if people remember back to that time, and I was even looking this up, now every movie is like a Marvel Universe movie or a DC Comics movie. This was like, it was not very often that you would see these type of movies. Like the last movie before Spider-Man that was a superhero movie was Batman and Robin, which flops terribly, as we all know. And Spider-Man not only was this huge hit, but it's like the last, one of the last movies I could think of where soundtracks really mattered. We don't have soundtracks like that anymore. And you couldn't turn on MTV or radio and not hear Hero by Chad Kroger with Josie. Yeah, it was, uh, again, man, I have to credit Lior Cohen and his genius, uh, because he was like, he was, he was like nobody we'd ever met. You know, first of all, he's one of the godfathers of hip hop. He yeah. is the guy that nabbed Beastie Boys. He's the one that helped put run DMC together with Russell, with Russell Simmons and get them going, um, you know, and uh, 
he had like Mariah Carey and Jay-Z and all these huge artists and uh, was just, I, I would pick his brain every time I was around him just to get more knowledge from him. But he's like this uh, former Israeli special forces soldier. And he's got like this Dolph Lundgren accent like this. And he goes, he told me, he, he called me one day on the road and this is back before everybody had cell phones, you know, and my tour manager was like, Leor Cohen's on the phone. You got to get on. So I pick up the phone. He goes, Josie, he goes, I want you to get together with Chad Kroger from Nickelback. That's me, by the way. Sorry about that. Keep going. <laughs> he said, he said uh, I want to get their best and my best minds together to write a song for the Spider-Man soundtrack. And I was like, <laughs> Spider-Man? I was like, dude, I'm down. I'm so in, dude. I was a fan of Spider-Man since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, bro. <laughs> and so he goes, okay, I will get you a plane ticket to Vancouver and you go meet with him and you write me a hit. So... I, I'm on a mission now. I go up to Vancouver. Uh, Chad picks me up from the airport. Never been to Canada. One of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen. I don't know if you've ever been to Vancouver, but my gosh, man, just what a great city. What a beautiful city. And, you know, Chad is a 100% rock star. Like he takes me out for sushi and, takes me out to like just takes me out for a night on the town in uh vancouver and then we end up back at the studio and uh i had my a and r guy with me uh rob stevenson at the time and we go in and he goes so i thought we could do like another like click click boom type song and we kicked that idea around for a minute, but I told him, I said, man, you know what? I said, I'm the type of guy that once I do something, that's already been done, man. You know what I mean? I want to, yeah. I want to really challenge ourselves and do something that people don't expect. Like, like uh, Al Pacino says in Devil's Advocate, I want to be the one they don't see coming. So we got into the, to the, to the room together, excuse me. And, uh, he goes, well, I have this one song. He goes, but the guys in Nickelback told me it's not a Nickelback song. And I was like, well, play it, you know? So he plays me, uh, you know, the meat and potatoes of what would be hero. And I was just like, dude, I was like, this is like, it all, it was like the first time I heard kiss from a rose by seal. I was like, dude, this is, this could be great, dude. I was Which like, Which is the last something. hit before that. That was a big movie soundtrack, superhero movie soundtrack song. So yeah. Yeah, I was like, dude, this could be something really special. So I yell out to my A&R guy, Rob Stevens. I was like, get in here, Rob. You got to hear this song, bro. <laughs> so he comes in, uh, he plays it again for him. And he goes, that's, that's the one. We got to do that song. So then uh rob goes away and and we sort of worked out how the, you know the structuring of the song and how the harmonies were going to go and how we we're going to put it all together and um i'm very thankful and grateful that uh chad gave me a a co-writer uh credit on that song uh i don't know if i deserved <laughs> one as much <laughs> But I'm very grateful for for getting to be a, a co-writer on that song, and and I was just glad to be in the room when it was birthed, you know. And so we jump in the studio and we uh, sang it, and we did, you know, I, we came up with the harmonies and how we were going to dress all that up. And uh, I I told him I said, man, can you give me like an Aretha Franklin moment at the end where I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, dude, blow it up. So uh i did that and then uh this dude moves so fast like he's so organized the, the next day we're in an airplane hangar and they've got this mock 
uh, New York style rooftop built with like a, a water, uh, like uh, like a the one of those water containers and and all all that like couches and uh, crates and everything set up looks just like an old dilapidated rooftop in New York. And then they got these huge green screens up behind us and beside us and. Uh, I asked the director, I was like, what's, what's all that going to be? And he goes, that's going to be the downtown New York city. That's going to be all the buildings and everything. And he goes, you guys just look around when you're playing and act like you see Spider-Man. Hmm. And I'm just like, dude, this can all be happening right now, man. <laughs> so we shoot the video uh, that day and I went away, went back on the road with saliva and you know, I think you have these special moments and you they're like your children. You you wish them well and you push them out into the world and you hope they do great things and you sort of go back to what you're doing and then boom, it freaking blew up, man. And yeah, like six months later, it's everywhere. And I was just so thankful to have been a part of it and to have gotten to, you know, like I said, watching the process and how much I learned from that process. And, you know, Matt Cameron came in uh, from uh, Pearl Jam and played drums. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. And dude, watching him work was just amazing. And, this older gentleman came in and was setting up his drums that morning. And, you know, I'm like a little kid, I'm running around going, well, what's your name? Well, well, what do you, what do you do? And, and he's like, you know, I, I, uh, I set up uh, Mr. Cameron's drums and uh, you know, I'm just here to knock everything together and we're going to make sure he sounds good when he gets here. And Matt's, I think Matt's wife was pregnant at the time and he was, you know, uh, waiting on his wife to, to, I think she was ready to go into labor almost. And, uh, so Matt comes in, he stands in the studio. He's a little bitty guy. He stands in the studio and he listens to the song three times. Never heard this song before in his life. He listens to it three times. He goes, okay, rewind it. He listens to it again. He goes, okay, rewind it. Listens (laughs) to it again. And then goes in the studio, dude, and freaking lays down this ingenious drum drum line dude just uh, like d- puts this sick drum roll right on the front of it dude just like yeah yeah Keep i'm right so high i can hear heaven i was just like my mind was blown dude and my mind is blown it. that i'm here with you getting to hear you sing this amazing song from all these years ago like all these years later man um, it's an honor dude man it's an honor for me to get to tell you this story <laughs> and just watching him he listened to it three times ian and then literally went in and played it three times then he goes okay i gotta get back home to my wife see you guys and poof he was gone and i remember asking uh chad i said man i said who's the guy that set up his drums, is he going to take him with him? He goes, Oh no, he's already gone, man. That's, uh, that's, uh, Mr. Slingerland. And I was like, excuse me. He goes, yeah. He goes, that's, uh, Mr. Slingerland. You, you saw he was playing Slingerland drums. I was like, yeah. Cause I'm a drummer at heart. I was a drummer before I was a singer. And I noticed that, that Matt Cameron was playing Slingerland drums. He said, yeah, man. He goes, that's, that's the kingfish from Slingerland, man. That's the the son of the guy that like made the company, and I'm yeah. just like, what? <laughs> with with how big the, that song got, I'm wondering, like, did the band worry that you were going to step away because you had such a massive hit that wasn't a saliva hit? Yeah, you know, I think they're, I think they were concerned about that maybe a a little but I never gave them a reason to be I was always like you know first and foremost I'm loyal to my dogs you know I'm I'm loyal to saliva no matter what you know what I mean and uh 
uh, I was doing some acting at the same time because, you know, William Morris was such a great company and is such a great company that they came to us and they said, we were in a, in a meeting one time and they made the mistake of telling me, they said, well, you, you know, we're a, a multifaceted company. If you guys want to do anything from act in a movie to write a cookbook, we got you. And I was like, <laughs> I want to act in a movie. I was like, I've been, I wanted to do movies since I was a little boy, man. Put me in the movies. You know what I mean? And uh, because of William Morris, man, I got to be in like Hustle and Flow with Terrence Howard. I got to do a cop show with Gary Cole, uh, the guy that plays Will Ferrell's dad in uh, Talladega Nights, uh, the guy from Office Space. And, um, you know, got to be in that in that show with Opie from uh, um, Sons of Anarchy and uh, Rashida Jones, Quincy Jones' beloved daughter, who is an amazing, funny lady and such an accomplished actress, man. And uh, just all these acting opportunities. Uh, I think they were more, you know, Chris had let me know that, that he was more worried about me because running off and becoming an actor than than uh leaving to to go do a solo career because i i really loved acting but i got to take you know i i got a taste of of what comes with the acting life you know you have to be up at dawn in the makeup chair by 7 a.m makeup total, on total opposite of rock star life which yeah is all nocturnal. And, and you got right i was like dude i became a, a rocker so I could sleep till 10 or 11 o'clock in the afternoon, yeah. man. I don't want, I don't want to be up at 6 a.m. You know what I mean? But, you know, it was a fun experience to get to do. Uh, I'm supposed to do a Western later this year, which is on my bucket list. I've always wanted nice. to do a Western. And, uh, but, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm just so, I hate to keep repeating myself, but I'm so grateful and thankful to have been afforded those opportunities and what a great life, man, that I get to, I get to go be an actor for a minute. And then I get to go, go on tour for a minute. So standing in line outside the bus and signing autographs for, for, for kids is no problem for me, man. That's why I've just always been just shocked and awed that they, they always say, man, I know you probably get this all the time and you're probably sick of it, but I'm like, dude, I'm not sick of this. I love this, man. Yeah, this is what you worked all your career to do, so I, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I was born so, to do this. Hell yeah, absolutely. And it's great to see that you're back out there on the road and doing these songs and celebrating these these tracks that you did with Wayne that people love. So I'm wondering, wh where are you going to be? I mean, like, I'm here in New York. Are you going to be doing any shows uh, out on the coasts or where, where, where do you plan on taking this? Well, I'm going to be in Los Angeles, uh, coming up in September. I'm going to do a show at the whiskey. No, a and, legendary venue that I got a chance to go to a couple years back for the first time. So, yeah, absolutely. It, which is another, like you said, another bucket list thing for me. Uh, I love LA, man. I, I love the, the rainbow and, and getting to hang out on, uh, on Sunset Strip, man, I love the Chateau Marmond, and you know where uh, where John Belushi used to hang out, and all those all those all those famous cats used to hang out. Uh, yeah, the I, amount of I, history, man. I got to see yeah, the comedy all the store while I was there. It was like, yeah, these are legendary yeah, spots. Absolutely, I, I'm I'm ate up with history, dude. I love history, man, and and I love getting to go and explore and. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm one of those guys. I'll even go look at the stars' homes and all that stuff, man. I love Los Angeles, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna be out in LA. Uh, I'm gonna route some shows uh, through Texas, and uh, I'm gonna make my way, uh, you know, through Arizona and New Mexico, and I'm gonna come back through um, the, you know, Denver, and uh, gonna hit. Uh, Illinois and Indiana and uh, so nowhere nowhere near me it sounds like nowhere near New York no well no definitely we'll be coming <laughs> okay. to New York 
We'll, we'll definitely be. If you're to anywhere York. near New York, I will come out, man. I know New York is kind of weird because I think New York gets very spoiled because everyone comes here. And right. I've noticed that it's funny. I mentioned Edsel Dope before, and I said this when he was on the show. I remember seeing, so he wouldn't mind me saying this. I remember seeing Dope play Webster Hall in New York City, and it was practically empty. I don't know why. I think it's just, like I said, New York gets every show. And then I went out to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and they packed the house out. So I feel like a lot of bands on, you know, that mid-level, if you're not Corn or Kiss or something like that, you get a lot more love in those areas of like Connecticut and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts than New York City. But I'm the type of guy, man, if I want to go see a show, I don't mind traveling two, three hours. I mean, if you're anywhere remotely, I'll be there. I mean, I'd, I'd love to see you do your thing live. I never got the chance to. Yeah, man. And we, and we would love to have you. The last time I played New York City, I think, uh, I think it was the Hammerstein Ballroom. Yeah. And I think it man. was possibly with Nickelback. I think it was with Nickelback and Fuel. Um, and man, what what an amazing place to play again. And that has history. to be a long time ago, though, because I feel like nowadays oh, Nickelback yeah. are playing. Oh, yeah. They're playing the oh, amphitheaters. Dude. They're playing the much bigger venues. And uh, oh, d- yeah. d- I, I got to ask you that, actually, before we wrap up, because I was thinking that as someone who worked with Chad Kroger, it's like one of those mysteries of the world. Why does Nickelback get so much shit? They get so much crap. And they have such a wide catalog of songs that people love. And for some reason, they're that band that people love to hate. And I, I don't understand it. Well, you know, I think that that is kind of a blessing and a curse for them. Uh, I think it works. If I know Chad, it works out to be nothing but a blessing. Uh, because, you know, like even... Colonel Tom Parker used to sell buttons. It's in the movie. Yeah. He used to sell buttons that said, I love Elvis. And then he would sell <laughs> buttons that said, I hate Elvis. Because you know why? He didn't want to miss any of that money. He didn't want to miss the money on the left. And he didn't want to miss the money on the right. He didn't give a damn who you loved or hated. He just didn't want to miss the money. And I think that's the, I think it's the same idea with, with Nickelback. I think you know, hey, they 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 are blessed and fortunate, and they know it to be that band. Uh, you know, he, Chad even jokes on stage about. Uh, y- you might remember this song, uh, photograph, uh, because you love the song, and then he says, and you might m- m- uh, know this song because there was about ten million memes of it. You yeah. know what I mean? But. Even even Donald Trump used a meme with photograph with like Joe Biden in it. Yeah, like no matter what, uh, my dad used to tell me uh, something happened in the band and I was really discouraged uh, about something that came out in the press. And he said, son, don't worry. He said, as long as they're spelling your name right, who cares? Yeah. A hundred years from now, who cares? He said, just be thankful that they're talking about you. Yeah, and, and as and long I, as your name I is think, spelled right on the checks, right? So that's right. <laughs> that's right. And I think it's the same with Nickelback. I think that they're at the end of the day, man. They they don't care. I I really don't know why. I think when you're on the top like that, a lot of people are going to take shots at you. Uh, Don Henley said one time back in the '70s, he said, uh, "It's cold and lonely up here," and there's some definite side winds that can take you out if you let them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also just, I think um, stuff gets played so much on the radio that it's like a song that you loved becomes a song that you hate. But at the end of the day, man, they're still playing these massive venues and they have their fan base and that's all that matters. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Creed. I'd love to see those guys get back together. They get kind of the same type of thing. And you you ask yourself why, because as you said, like when we started the interview, it's all about the songs. And both those bands, Nickelback and Creed, they have the songs, they have the catalog. No one can take that away from them. Yeah, man. Not many bands can say, talking about Creed, not many bands can, can say that they have back-to-back diamonds. Yeah. That's insane. Like, this guy told me one time, he goes, that's more albums than sticks, bro. 
that that's like more albums in a grouping than Zeppelin, man. That's just insane. And it's one of those things know, that makes you wonder why can't these guys, it's so many bands you feel that way. Why can't these guys get back together and get back on the road? People want to hear this stuff. And yeah. it's one of those eternal questions. But at the same time, I don't think people do realize, as you kind of said earlier, being on the road, it's closer than a marriage. You're married to these other two guys or three guys, and you're out on the road at all times. And I'm sure just like the slightest thing is going to get on your nerves and get blown out of proportion. And you no longer want to be around this person. I mean, I love doing the show with Chris. It'd probably feel differently if we were 24 seven connected with each other, anyone that I love. I mean, you know, family members and, and friends, yeah. if you're around them 24 seven, some small thing they do is going to get on your nerves and I think people don't realize that aspect when they say, why can't these guys just get along or, or even just that the fact that you got, you know, like with your band, you and Wayne, you got two guys who are writing the lion share of the material and there might be jealousy over that. There's so many things. I think at the, at the end of the day, you have to uh, surrender yourself to, to the fact that marriage is work, man. Marriage is Marriages only work if someone is willing to put in the work, you know, with my, with my own marriage to my wife, you know, we've been through some hellacious times, you know what I mean? Where we had to maneuver through some really gnarly stuff. Uh, but you have to want to stay together and you have to take breaking up off the table. I think that's two things that you have to do. You have to divorce yourself, if you will, from, mm -hmm. from divorcing. And it's hard to do that when it's a four-way or a five-way proposition. It's, it's a lot, I won't say easier, but it's a lot simpler when it's two people. But when it's five, man, it's, it can get really complicated. Like Bon Jovi said, uh, they got off of a private jet and left with five middle fingers going five different directions. Yeah. You know, and that's, that was their goodbye was F you, F you, F you, you're cool. F you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Great quote. And, yeah. And, and like you said, you know, it, 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 it's hard to, to get around that, you know, you, you like, you, like you said, the, the guy can do that thing, you know, that that's that one little thing that can piss you off, but you, you have to, those are the things, those are the breaks, man. And those are the, those are the knocks that you have to get used to uh, on the road and you have to coexist with, with other guys. And you have to, you have to approach every situation with love. I mean, I don't mean to preach, but you have to approach every situation with love. You have to look at it through the eyes of love, first and foremost. Yeah, it's well said, man. And and just value this time with people. And, and you're certainly realizing right now, I mean, several times that life is so precious and life could be very short. And yeah, to value that time there, whether it's family members, whether it's friends, you could learn from that even if you're not in a band. Um, so I certainly try to value that time and that same aspect. Um, but for the audience, once again, it's josiescottrocks.com at josiescottrocks on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, I'm I'm going to leave the audience wanting more, I think, because I definitely do want to do a part two with uh, Chris here as well. I think that you guys would connect on so much stuff. But this was this was an honor, man. It's, it, you know, the same way that you dreamt of one day being on stage for me like when I started out doing this radio stuff which is now like 17 years I believe I, I always wanted to interview rock stars and it's like I I got to start interviewing people in the special operations world after I met a Navy SEAL named Brandon Webb and then from there working with Chris Peranto but I mean my love always has been music since since a little kid since listening to like Bob Marley on my dad's lap at four years old to then discovering stuff on my own, whether it was Metallica or Korn or, you know, all this other stuff that I listened to. And just as you said, the same as your fans, I'm the same way. I mean, these saliva songs are definitely the soundtrack to my life. And, um, and also I think it's going to answer some questions people have had because people who are fans of your music do wonder, man, after all these years, why didn't I hear Josie Scott 
sing for saliva or they or there's also those casual fans who go to a tour and they just see saliva on the billboard and truthfully they go this isn't the guy who sang the songs what's going on so uh-huh. it's good to get some closure for that for those people absolutely man and uh i appreciate you taking the time with me and, and spending some time with me. I'm glad I got to meet you, Ian. And, and tell Peranto that I look look forward to kicking it with him, too, the next time around. Absolutely. I'll have to send him a video of that so he knows, because he's definitely a fan. Um, we appreciate it. And for the audience, as always, um, if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, subscribe. If you're listening on all the podcast platforms, subscribe. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, all that good stuff at Battle Line Pod on Twitter, at Battle Line Podcast on Instagram. Uh, this has been great, and we will do a part two um, to promote whatever you're up to. I mean, if it if it ends up being stuff with the other current guys in the Saliva Band or whatever it is, we're, we're definitely an outlet for you. So we enjoy yes, having you. Enjoy being here. Go Grizzlies! Go Grizzlies! <laughs> Hell yeah! That's all for this episode of Battle Line Podcast but we're always posting new content on social media. Follow us on Instagram at Battleline Podcast and on Twitter at Battleline Pod. That's an order. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes up every Tuesday. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform of choice. Believe in yourself. Face all challenges head on. And as always... Never quit.